I'm going to talk today. I'm so I'm so we can use all of this later in the video editor will sort this out. But I'm Dr. Ruth Roberts, your pet's ally, and I want to talk a little bit today about low methionine diets. Um, and this is a concept that's evidently been around for quite some time, um, actually since 1974, but on the human side, they're just now starting to incorporate it into strategies for helping to control cancer, um, but prevention wise, and then uh, to, to help treat it as well. And so it's pretty interesting. Um, there's, you know, we all have beliefs about what we think a good diet is, and unfortunately in the veterinary side, the raw diet is like the dogma, so to speak. And so sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. Um, and having been on keto diet myself for a num you know, almost ooh, seven years uh, and having experienced some side effects from that diet, it's a uh, kind of time to suspend what we believe about how we should eat and actually sort of figure out what does work. And so the reason low methionine diets are becoming um, more popular, if you will, or more in the forefront of nutrition research is because tumor cells, you know, so we're, one of the things we're looking to do in cancer is find a way to make tumor cells stop uh, growing out of control. And so the keto diet has been used as a treatment um, and in fact, there's a ton of different diets out there and I'll do a screen share so you can kind of get a synopsis on, on these. Um, but this is, uh, Nalini Chilkoff's kind of overview of therapeutic diets and cancer metabolism. And, you know, so the one that has quite a bit of research is keto diet. There's the American paleo diet, the zone diet. Her version of all of this is the outsmart cancer diet. And then there's the Mediterranean diet and then the bone broth diet, which I haven't even heard of that one. And I'll throw up these handouts in into the uh, lesson part once this is all put together. But I, what she's doing here is comparing the macronutrient ratios of protein, fat, and carbohydrate. So the keto diet, you know, the, all of them are roughly in the same ballpark, except for the Mediterranean diet is significantly lower in protein. And um, you'll notice she does not have vegan and vegetarian diets specifically in here, but she does offer uh, for human clients um, the ability to, uh, I don't know, I'm gonna put you on mute for a minute, Bettina. Um, so she does offer her human clients the ability to use a vegan or a vegetarian version of any of these diets. And that's, that's easy to do, believe it or not, even for keto diets. So there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of stuff out there. And what do we know to, how do we know what to trust? And this is where it gets really confusing. So low methionine diets, that concept started, as I said, in 1974, and it showed that normal cells will grow in a Petri dish with a nutrient broth that does not have methionine, just fine. Um, but cancer cells do not, which is interesting because methionine is considered to be an essential amino acid, meaning you have to consume it in order for your body to be able to utilize it. The body cannot make methionine from other, uh, from other amino acids. So granted, this is in a, you know, a cell broth. And so we're look, we're not looking at sustaining life of a living organisms, just cells over a specific period of time of maybe days to weeks. So the other thing that's interesting about methionine is that cancer cells produce sulfur from the methionine amongst other things. And they preferentially use this amino acid to make more cancer cells. But this is also why dogs can smell tumors. So it's the sulfur smell that they're able to, to detect in, you know, however it is, if you're looking for colon cancer in a stool sample, bladder cancer in a urine sample, breath, things like that. Um, so this is kind of, this is kind of interesting. And there's a, a lot of punning going on in the nutritional uh, 
uh, community about the, a whole new meaning in terms of lab tests. Um, but it, it gets really interesting from here. So in the 90s, there were uh, there was a paper that looked at mice that were fed a methionine restricted diet um, with a type of colon cancer that is resistant to chemotherapy and in specific uh, five floxyuracil. Um, so during this study, they had a control group of, of course that ate a normal diet and then a group that ate a methionine restricted diet. And the mice that were fed the methionine restricted diet had their tumor shrink because all of a sudden the cancer cells were now no longer able to do all of the things that they like to do and resist the five uh, floxy, five FU is what the abbreviation is for that chemotherapeutic drug treatment. So what happened was um, the cancer cells need methionine to repair their DNA. And because they were deprived of it, they weren't able to resist the chemotherapeutics, which is really interesting. So the, the RDA for people um, is about 19 milligrams per kilogram per day. And uh, methionine for methionine and cysteine and for um, um, the average requirements about 15 milligrams per kilograms per day. And so that means that for the average person, they're going to allow 800 to 1200 milligrams of methionine per day for most adults. Um, so, you know, this is where it gets really the Sometimes it works in direct translation from humans to dogs, and sometimes it does not. So to, to stay healthy, then the average human is going to need somewhere around 900 milligrams of methionine. So it's also clear that a lack of methionine has been linked to like early graying of hair. Um, if you are restricting methionine, you're also restricting protein in general. And so if you're not taking in enough protein, then all sorts of bad things happen, like you can't rebuild muscle, you can't repair tissues, things of that nature. And it also tends to knock your hormone system out of whack. Uh, so that's, you know, so what we don't want to do is super restrict protein because that's not going to help anything either. And there's a lot of information that seniors, whether that's humans or pets actually need more protein uh, on somewhere on the order of 15 to 25% more. And any healing or sick person or animal also probably needs that increase of protein of 15 to 25%. So for dogs, the National um, Resource uh, Research Council, sorry, um, and I'll throw this up here too so you can kind of see what I'm talking about. The NRC is who determines um, what our sort of average daily requirements would be, if you will. And the maddening thing is that they don't base it on body weight, but they base it on a thousand kilocalories of nutrients, which just makes getting the conversion absolutely crazy. So they are saying that a minimum of 60. 0.65 grams, which is 650 milligrams per day for dogs. And the reason I'm not going to talk about cats through this presentation at all is that they are obligate carnivores. So this strategy, I just, I don't think will work at all and will create a great deal of health issues. And so, um, so back to this, you know, the nutrient requirements for dogs. Um, so 0.83 is the recommended allowance per thousand calories <laughs> you know, of, of pet, if you will, per day. So gosh, that just is like crazy to try and figure it out because none of these things are, um, are easy to kind of back calculate, if you will. So what does that mean for dogs? So if we've, if we talk about an average 50 pound dog, let's say, then that means we're going to need to shoot for about 900 um, calories per day to maintain body weight. And then, so that's going to take us to roughly 75, uh, 750 milligrams of methionine per day. And also that dog needs a minimum of 50 grams of protein per day. 
Now, because we are so accustomed to feeding um, protein-based diets, this is where it gets a little tricky. Uh, so, and again, I'll pop this back up. Uh, so if we look at, for instance, the nutrient density in the crock pet diet, and this is part of what a nutritionist did for me some years ago. So this is looking at a batch of food. Um, and so that's 2000 calories per day. We come up with, or per batch, I should say. And so we come up with this ratio of 30% protein, 42% fat and 28% carbohydrates. And I know that because a gram of protein is four, four calories, a gram of carbohydrate is also four calories, and a gram of fat is nine, uh, nine calories. So that's how we can kind of work this back. Now, if we scroll down through this nutritional analysis down to the amino acid portion, we can see that methionine here is at 3.7 um, grams per batch. So again, if we're looking at having to feed a 50 pound dog 900 calories a day, and this is 2000 calories, um, then that's 1.72, which is far in excess of that, uh, grams rather, which is far in excess of that 750 milligrams. So because this diet is something we can manipulate uh, for pets with uh, cancer, then what we can end up doing is decreasing the animal protein, increasing plant-based proteins, um, but still get adequate amounts of protein that should be highly absorbable for pets. And then as we decrease animal protein, we're also going to decrease the fat. So I think that we're going to end up with something along the lines of probably 25% um, protein and then carbohydrates up to around 50%. And then the cat, uh, the fat rather, um, will end up being around 25% of the diet too. Now, this is a whole huge shift from keto diet. And the reason I'm bringing this up is that many people that have put pets on keto diets to try and um, help you know, prevent the cancer from taking over and actually feed the dog and not the cancer, have found that it is really difficult to keep weight on. And that is the absolute truth. And so this is a, sh a, a shift in strategy that I think would allow us to, um, to start to feed our pets what they need, but also uh, kind of as far as calories go, and then, um, then also kind of deprive the cancer of one of the nutrients it really prefers. So then we start to think about, okay, well, what are low methionine foods? And so the vegans think this is really great because it, it vindicates their outlook on life. And to some degree it does, but I think we have to, you know, reformulate this for um, taking into account the other nutritional needs. And then there's a couple of hacks around this too. So this is a handout from the Texas Children's Hospital uh, that lists out low methionine foods because there's a type of uh, cystinuria that is that creates crystals in the bladder from high methionine diet and also with liver issues, this is a problem too. So you can see that uh, most of the fruits and veggies and um, things of that nature and many of the nuts as well are going to be really low methionine. The moderate ones are gonna be more of the legumes and some of the uh, cheeses. And then the high methionine foods are going to be the animal proteins. And interestingly, um, pork is really high in methionine, um, and then cured meats are extremely high in methionine as well. So things like, uh, you know, hams and, uh, uh, you know, pr gross stuff like hot dogs, things of that nature, but also charcuterie, which has gotten to be super popular, although, you know, because because we uh, decided a high meat diet was a good thing. And so now we revel in eating lots of bacon. Um, so that's the other 
kind of really common preserved foods. But even canned tuna is really quite high. I think fresher fishes are lower. Uh, interestingly, Brazil nuts are quite high um, in methionine. And then beef, uh, so chicken, and it, it's really interesting, these levels vary all over the place, but um, beef and, uh, excuse me, chicken and fish seem to be higher in methionine than most, uh, most beef. So that's interesting. And then if we, I'm going to take you over to this website for Brenda Davis and she is, you think she is vegan? I think so. Um, but this is an excellent article and she does write really rational things about nutrition. And so she lists out, okay, who should, should I be on a methionine restricted diet? And she points out in humans that, you know, you've got to eat enough of this stuff as well as cysteine, which is another sulfur containing amino acid. Um, but methionine seems to be the one that is being focused on in research. So for um, people that have a specific genetic mutation, which can lead to elevated homocysteine, which is one of those molecules that tends to kick you into um, metabolic syndrome, this can really help. Uh, cancer, there is quite a bit of evidence actually um, that when cancer cells are deprived of methionine, they tend to undergo cell death and again are probably going to be more sensitive to uh, chemotherapeutic treatments as well as probably nutritional interventions or herbal interventions against cancer. And um, the other thing is that it helps to improve insulin sensitivity and lipid metabolism while decreasing systemic inflammation. And frankly, that's kind of the gold, that's the gold bar. If we could all figure out how to do this, um, then we'd be in good shape. And then also it tends to help us lose weight as well as improve um, insulin sensitivity. So this is a great article. The other thing she's really, um, she's really laid out clearly here is that uh, the levels of methionine in each of these types of foods. And so she laid them out by vegetables, um, fruits, and, uh, and then it looks like we're getting into legumes and then grains and then nuts and then some seeds and then animal products. And so, the, this is interesting to me because the egg yolk is very high in methionine. So I think she's meaning egg whites here um, as a protein source. So that's one option. Cheeses are lower in methionine. And then, um, you know, we just looking at about three ounces of beef, we're at 650 milligrams of methionine. So if you've got a pet you're trying to work this on, um, this gets really tough. So the the other cool thing is that there is kind of a hack around this because we want to provide enough protein and enough digestible and easily to assimilate protein. And I have seen dogs that are on vegan diets that develop liver enzyme problems, elevations, because they're not getting the right nutrition. But most of the commercial vegan diets are like just beans, pretty much. And so we're back to that same issue with the grain-free diets, where 68% of the caloric content of that diet was were legumes. And so we have a terrific amount of anti-nutrients popping up there. So the hack is to actually include something called glycine, which is another amino acid in the, into each meal if we need to use more um, animal proteins. So there's an argument that we ended up sort of selecting for a high methionine diet because we stopped eating the entire animal. And I'm sure that most dogs would be very happy to eat skin, hair, teeth, and eyeballs and bones. And then that sort of balances out the amino acid profile. So what, what they're doing for humans is to uh, take about two grams of glycine per meal and then if we extrapolate that back to our 50 pound dog, that's gonna be about 667 milligrams of glycine per meal. 
I can tell you from experience that glycine does not taste that great and it can have some GI upset stuff. So we have to just kind of, if we're gonna use that strategy, gradually increase uh, the amount of glycine per meal to kind of help, help offset that amount of methionine. So this is, it's really interesting, the kind of the research that's coming out there. And um, I thought this might be an important strategy for those of you that are dealing with cancer. Um, it, it's taking me a little while to wrap my head around all of the research, but I'll be working on reformulating a version of the crock pet diet to to match this sort of low methionine diet and then see what we can do to incorporate foods that are higher in glycine um, or and, and then get the correct amount of glycine added in per meal so that this kind of works out a little bit more easily. So that is what I have kind of prepared. Um, but I just, I find it very interesting that, uh, that this research is out there. And when, you know, a nutritionist was commenting, there's a very entertaining video about low methionine diets and he presents some of the research really very effectively and, and a lot of lab test puns. But he said, you know, when he starts talking about, well, why aren't they doing this more frequently in human oncology? And he says, you know, and there's a paper he's quoting, but essentially the idea is that oncologists really aren't that interested in nutrition. Although I think on the veterinary side that that is definitely um, not, the, not the case. In fact, Greg Ogilvy, uh, who was at the University of Colorado, really pioneered nutrition specifically to target and support the cancer patient and improve the outcome of uh, cancer regimens. So that's kind of what I've got. Um, and I'm gonna un let Bettina unmute herself. Um, and so we can have more conversation if you would like. <laughs> I'm, I'm back. Yeah, sorry, Mary was biking. <laughs> yeah, that's really interesting because, uh, you know, when Mary was um, diagnosed with her GIST and had her tumor removed, um, our oncologist gave her, what, three months? told us that chemo was the only way to go and uh, no diet change and yeah. that was, that was what a year and a half ago and she's doing wonderful and yeah. all three are doing great murphy was on on a on a low protein grain free kibble when we adopted him and three months later he developed the irregular heartbeat yeah. and i put, put him on your crock pet diet and within six months the irregular heartbeat was gone. I yeah. mean, it was amazing. And nobody believed that when I tell people that. And then, you know, when Bea kept going in for surgery after he was eating rocks in Appleton, they told me, oh no, home cook. No, 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 no. You need to buy the, this pre prescription diet. And I'm like, no, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> nope. <laughs> and yeah, well, that's why he's eating rocks. And I said, no, he's not eating rocks because of his diet. I said, he eats rocks because he likes the, the texture. Yeah. And the guy kept arguing with me and I said, my other two dogs are also on, on the same diet and they don't eat rocks, yeah. uh, you know? So it's like, they, they keep saying that this is the only way to go. You got to go with the chemo, you got to do with the prescription and you don't, don't go holistically. But I found out now that um, slowly but surely when you go to Appleton, they now say, oh yeah, we heard of Dr. Lisa. Yes, and we heard of the crock pet diet. So they're Good. starting to at least dots together. Yeah, because that's you know? the, the problem is that, you know, it takes, and this is the frustration with, with medicine is that it takes decades and, and literally sometimes centuries, sadly, in the case of human medicine, to change, to stop doing something that's not working and to change and find mm -hmm. another option. But it's, mm -hmm. it's so frustrating. Um, and, and again, this is another form of cognitive bias. Because the doctors believe this is the way, then they refuse to look at other, other options. And I've been guilty of that myself. I think we all have in various aspects of our life. But it's, it's you know, we've got to do something because this cancer epidemic is just out of control. Yep. And it has to be. I mean, there's all sorts of garbage in the environment we didn't have 
some years ago, but also the more refined the diets get and the more mononutrient diets get, then the worse things seem to get. And that, that was what was interesting. I don't know if you caught this in the iPets Ally. Sri was talking about mono feeding her dog, Cece, who's just really had a bad time with gastric mm -hmm. reflux. And so that's effectively what she's doing is having a day on and a day off of a lomothionine diet. And so I'm starting to wonder if that's part of what is going on. So this is, this is kind of the other interesting thing is that for metabolic effects with the keto diet, it's, there have been several papers published that say a week on and a week off is equal to all keto all the time. And yeah, so it's like, oh, you mean we don't have to just do this forever and ever? Um, so that's kind of interesting. And then the other thing is there's a ton of people out there saying intermittent fasting and calorie restriction and blah, 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 blah. And those, you know, there's some shred of evidence for each, each of those things. But it turns out that something called time-restricted eating uh, is equal to 25% calorie deprivation every day all the time and uh, intermittent fasting, which is generally 16 hours of not eating, eight hours where you can eat. Um, and that's, that's not so hard, but it turns out that time-restricted eating, which is basically 13 hours of fasting overnight, uh, in, in a study of women that had breast cancer, the women that, and they didn't change anything of what they were eating. They simply restricted the time where they were eating. So they stopped eating snacks after a certain time, uh, you know, sitting in front of the television. And that was basically the only change they made. The amazing thing was that 45% of these women that had really high risk uh, breast cancer did not relapse. And in the control group, something like fifth, um, only 15% did not relapse. So just by changing that one thing, not even changing what they were eating, uh, completely changed their lives. Uh, and it, it did seem to help them lose weight and, and have better insulin resist sensitivity and things of that nature. So it's really fascinating what's coming out. It is. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Now with my dog, fasting is not an option. <laughs> no. My dogs like to eat, my dogs like to eat twice a day. They're very scheduled on that. Yeah. If so. That, yeah. If you don't do that, we're going to be like, what, 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 what? Yeah. And my, and our guys <laughs> would too. But so, but that thirteen hours uh, of time restricted eating, that's re eating rather, that's really easy to do. So, you know, if you, if you make the last meal at five o'clock, then if you feed at seven o'clock in the morning, you've done that. You've, you've knocked the 13 mm -hmm. hours back. So that's super out. That's super easy. Yeah, that's easy. That is yeah. true. Yeah. So that one's. Especially the dogs that are on protocols, like Mary, she, she needs her herbs twice a day. So I have to feed her twice a day and so is Murphy. Exactly. Exactly. And I think yeah, that I'll, makes it easier. Mm -hmm. yeah, and I think that a lot of dogs, um, you know, they, it, it just, it's like us. I mean, it's, it's a lot easier to wrap your head around, uh, you know, making your last meal at 7 PM and then maybe eating breakfast at, at say, uh, 8 AM. Um, mm -hmm. so it just, yeah, it really is pretty easy to shift. So, uh, well, so that's kind of where I'm trying to figure out is what else can we do to support these cancer patients instead of just throwing more fat at them. And right. then fortunately we keep seeing dogs that'll end up with pancreatitis as a result. Right. So that's with Mary, I couldn't strategy. have done the keto because of her, uh, of her, they said that she had a tendency to get pancreatitis because they had to uh, take a little bit off when they were doing the surgery. Yeah. So they were worried about that. So they told me not to do keto. Yes. Yeah. And that's, you know, it's tough. It's really tough. But I think this is another strategy. So I'll be working on kind of reformulating a recipe based around this. Um, so we'll know how to kind of go forward with it. That's what I've got for today. Awesome. And I love your phytospore. Um, I was, yeah, I got I got a uh, Murphy is still on restore because he needed a whole gut repair because he was all over the place. And uh, his skin is so much better since we started this. 
And then Bea and Mary are on the phytospore and they're doing great. Great. So are you finding, are you, so the restore is now called ion something or another, right? Is that correct? Am I thinking of the um, same product? The restore, hold on one second, I have to look at the box. Yeah. I have so many things I give my dogs. Yeah. If I don't look it up, I'll give you something wrong. <laughs> it's from a microbiome, yeah. It's restore flora. Restore flora, it's called. Ah, okay. Restore flora. Okay. Well, he's yeah. on that for three months, and then we're doing we're doing the uh, detox. He's still on the bentonite clay. Yeah. And and he's on the cumin oil and the and the melatonin, and that and that cleared up his skin. Like he looks he looks amazing. That's awesome. He hasn't been itchy. He's on that on that um, restriction yet. We're only giving him pork right now and uh, turkey. Nothing else. And then the quack pet died like always. Yeah, they look that's awesome. That is yeah. fantastic. Oh yeah, so that's the the spore and yeast probiotic. Okay, so it's that's the one with. Yeah, because his gut, we did a microbiome on him, and his gut was just terrible. Yeah. And his anxiety got higher and higher. Yeah, and this probably and dropped even, it down. Oh, it way down, and I still do the loop with him and all that, and he's doing so much better. That's why I I didn't want to do the rabies vaccine because that would knock it all out again. Because we've just yeah. got him where we wanted him. Yeah. And it's like every time we get him somewhere, then we have to do something that will ruin all that again. Yeah, and this is so. And interestingly, so in on the human side, this is where they talk about using low methionine diets for depression and anxiety. So. That may be something worth exploring a little bit for him. Um, that would be great. Yeah, because according to the uh, Glacier Peak, uh, he's allergic to everything and everybody. <laughs> yeah, but he's doing really well with this. Yeah. Right. We restricted it. Yeah. And, and he's doing good. But, you know, I'm still keeping everything out because it's only been three months, end of February. Yeah. And then in March, I'm going to slowly but surely introduce them back to garlic and turmeric and all that stuff because he's off all of that right now yeah and that's just and that's real clear that you know it's just he's got leaky gut syndrome and he was reacting to everything he eats mm -hmm. and i think that's that's kind of what you've found is that each time it's like okay now he's eating this stuff and now he's sensitive to it is mm -hmm. that am i remembering that right yep. yep yeah because his first test he was only allergic to um to chicken yeah hardly anything else and now it's like boom 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 he was allergic over to everything even vegetables we had to limit everything we had to go like way down you know there's a there's another or i remember you had to go crazy um you know getting that stuff but there's another microbiome products called um mega mega immune i think it is uh mega mucosa and this is really interesting because one of the issues with gut disease is that it's typically, we've got low IgA, which prevents, and I'll share this with you too, but it prevents um, pets or people from being able to fight off uh, all sorts of stuff. Uh, and keep the get the gut intact. And so what they've come up with is this these four amino acids, so proline, serine, threonine, and cysteine, which again, this is one of the higher uh, sulfur containing ones, and then paired it with immunoglobulins that will help to repair the uh, repair the gut as well as some bioflavonoids. And so this is something you know you could you could consider if, if you're still having trouble getting Murphy's gut squared away. Um, okay. But I, yeah, so this is a, for myself, this is something I'm gonna launch into now that I'm finally off of Zafaxin. And, okay. uh, and then I can start taking their human probiotic. But this, but this ha, you know, from the research I've seen, this should be quite helpful as far as uh, getting the gut, uh, the gut function back online, if you will. Great. So, yeah. So thank cool. you. Yeah, I write yeah. that down. That's, yeah. That's so and if you need help with it, just let me know. But you can talk to Lisa about it as well. But I think that's going to be very helpful in, in kind of rebuilding the gut barrier more quickly. Yeah, because he's done with the restore at the end of the month. And yeah. then um, then she didn't say what we're going to do after that. 
And I was thinking maybe we'll do him on the fighter score, but I don't know where he's at right now. I don't know how you can retest that. You know, and here's the frustrating thing about those, the microbiome tests, um, on the pet side of it, is that if we retest in 30 days, we're going to see virtually no change. And I think this is where you got to mm -hmm. take six, and I think you've experienced that mm -hmm. you know, six to 12 months later, then you might see some change. But ultimately for him, I think it's going to be, do, does his food reaction list go down? And right that's going to tell, tell us that his barrier has sealed back over and he's no longer reacting to what he's eating. So I think that's going to be your guideline more than anything else. And I think probably going to phytospore as sort of a maintenance probiotic is the way to go because the sarcomyces is intended to be used for about a month or so to help kind of get the gut to seal back down um, and then go mm -hmm. back to a more kind of a long-term probiotic, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Great, yeah. thank you. You're welcome. All right, well, I am going to call it a day. And how are you doing with snow and stuff? Is that, uh, 